All right, great. Well, it looks like we have uh, quite a few of the uh, registered attendees uh, have been able to log in. So hello and welcome to today's presentation from Digital Dream Labs. Uh, this is our quarterly update for the state of robotics. My name is Matt Eversole, and I'm joined today by my colleagues, Robbie Broussard, our Director of Customer Experience, Ryan Gardner, our Chief Gaming Officer, and Jacob Hanchar, our CEO. So the agenda for today, uh, we'll be starting off uh, this presentation uh, with a review of OverDrive. Uh, we'll then be looking at updates for Vector Cosmo, as well as uh, a brief discussion of what goes into Butter Robot's Garbage Brain with our Chief Gaming Officer, uh, Brian Gardner, as well as uh, an update on the status of manufacturing and when everybody who's backed those pre-order campaigns can expect to see the robot. Uh, we will then finish up with a live Q&A session. Uh, so you can ask questions of any of our panelists and uh, we'll get you some answers. All right, so with that being said, let's get started with OverDrive. Uh, Jacob, I know OverDrive has, uh, you know, we, we've been moving ahead with InfiniDrive. Uh, what, what can our attendees expect to see from Digital Dream Labs for OverDrive in the future? Thanks, Matt. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, for the OverDrive people, uh, do not worry. We have not abandoned you. We haven't forgotten. We are still working on it. Uh, work is slower, though, because we have focused primarily on uh, getting the robots out the door, uh, particularly uh, Vector and Cosmo. We have InfiniDrive done. Uh, it's working. And if we, for every one section of charging track, you can have about eight sections of non-charging track. And the charge uh, happens within about a second as the uh, car is going over it. So what we would like to do is have people start signing up uh, for the list and particularly beta beta users. We are going to have this manufactured in South Carolina. So I've been trying really hard to keep it being made in the United States. So that's a little bit trickier than uh, abroad, obviously, but we've made a, a tremendous amount of progress and we think we will have this out as soon as we have the other robots out and we've kind of finish the, the QA, QC portion of that. So watch out for that later. If you want to sign up, we'll have, we'll probably have a, a, a if you want to submit to support at digitaldreamlabs.com or else we'll circulate kind of a, an email to kind of get people to sign up and begin to uh, test and start, start testing the new track and this new technology. Now, there are other details to InfiniDrive that I wanted to add before uh, Brian starts his, his portion of it. So I think most of everyone is aware, obviously, that's why we started the repair center of the battery issues and other things like that. Retailers got burned big time. There are all kinds of licensing issues with Universal now that that's expired and the Fast and the Furious, we, we don't have rights to it. So what we're going to have to do is start fresh and with a new app and a new look and everything like that. We'll keep supporting the, uh, the original stuff for sure. So, so don't, don't worry about that. But moving forward, as we do the rebranding the re and the relaunch, there's going to be a total uh, new game and new features and all that stuff. So without getting into any more details, I'll turn it over to Brian. He can fill you in on the exciting developments. Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, so as Jacob mentioned, uh, a lot of our software and hardware team is really tied up with our 2021 releases. But coming from our educational games background, we have a full game design and art team that has been really attacking uh, the OverDrive uh, property and trying to see what we can bring to that. And the thing we're most excited to bring to it is augmented reality. Um, I've never seen a technology that works better with augmented reality. You have the fixed track that's really easy for computer vision to keep track of, combined with the cars knowing where they are on the track, which is how the whole driving system works. You have the app that uses weapons and different abilities that can you know, be visualized in AR now. Um, and then we wanna add new features like picking up power-ups or speed boosts, dodging things on the track, having new environments around it shown through your screen. 
And, and we really just want to, you know, bring it into the, you know, into 2022, 2023, wh whatever. We want to make it modern and new and exciting. Um, and we want to make sure that it's a fully fledged game that supports uh, InfiniDrive uh, and just all the capability that this technology has. Um, so we've been working on new art uh, to just, you know, bring it up. Uh, Matt, you want to show some of that stuff? Um, so, you know, our, our team from our other games has been really attacking this and trying to, you know, breathe new life into it. So it's, it's, it's fully new, um, new characters, new environments, new story. Um, we're working to add uh, controller support to it to work better with the augmented reality. So the controller could clip to your phone and, you know, free up the screen to be fully done with uh, augmented reality. And um, we're just really excited about it. Uh, you know, we've been dreaming a lot about this and we're really excited to finally be able to share uh, some of our dreams um, for this kind of optimistic cyberpunky world that we want to bring overdrive into. Um, so, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's the new overdrive app. <laughs> All right, thanks. Great, thanks, thanks, Brian. All right, well, then let's, let's move into uh, our update for Vector. Uh, we'll have uh, Robbie give us an update on uh, where we are with 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 Vector and uh, Vector 2.0. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Robbie. So uh, one thing that we've been working on pretty specifically is or um, is basically our public documentation. The public documentation is um, really important to empower users to be able to troubleshoot issues, um, learn about new features, and learn about um, you know, effectively kind of uh, interact with their robot in the, in the most helpful way for them. And so one of my basic projects has been expanding the public documentation from a developer side, as well as from uh, kind of like a basic troubleshooting side so that you guys can, uh, you know, have the power to investigate things yourself and, and figure out, um, you know, either issues with the robot if you have them, or just learn a little bit more about your companion. And so um, you'll probably have, you'll probably notice a lot more support um, articles out there. I also have a public board where I keep um, logs of my progress and you can actually submit for articles to be created if you have any particular questions or things like that that aren't really aren't answered by the current articles. So um, I will share a link to that and um, you feel free to submit you know for new articles to be created um, and I will absolutely uh, you know, take any feedback and that kind of thing on our public documentation so that we can make it the best it can, it can be. Um, and thanks very much for any input you guys have on that. So I'll share a link on that here uh, pretty shortly. We also have some new updates for Escape Pod. Um, Escape Pod had a pretty successful release. We um, There's a lot of people that are enjoying the Escape Pod and uh, there's a lot of opportunities for uh, the Escape Pod to expand on what Vector can do. Uh, for instance, there was a um, an extension engine that was um, that was built by one of our developers during the escape pod um, you know development that effectively allows you to basically bring in any data that you want from other sources such as uh, other apis um, like you know different smart devices you could you know if you wanted to i mean uh, we don't have all of this type of stuff like directly built out for you. So, you know, there would be some programming on your end or maybe you can, um, you know, maybe one of the community developers would would tackle this. But if you wanted to pull, you know, temperature and things like that from like, you know, your Nest thermostat or, you know, other smart devices, uh, you could basically pull information from anywhere that information is is able to be put out from. So that's a really exciting thing. And we're looking forward to doing more documentation on that, uh, as well as uh, maybe creating some more examples and things like that that people can use uh, to to program things that uh, that they would want to see or that they can share with other people. So that's um, those, those are a couple, couple of good things with the escape pod. And then additionally, uh, we are working on an update to the escape pod, and that's that's currently in beta testing where um, we allow the escape pod to be reached by its IP address rather than just calling escape pod .local. Uh, Some networks or some routers don't really support the, um, you know, the protocols that the escape pod uses. Um, 
they should be fairly standard, but in some cases we're finding that they're not. So we're uh, we're making an update uh, proactively to make uh, people, uh, you know, make the escape pod more accessible for people with those types of networks. And um, there's a couple of other bug fixes and things like that in the escape pod that should um, uh, that should definitely help with a couple of other features with it. Uh, we also have quite a few announcements from the Oscar side. Um, so. We were able to find a lot of the animation and sound assets from, uh, you know, from Vector, and there's a lot of there's a lot of proprietary code and things like that that um, that are kind of interspersed with the Oscar stuff that we that we have to kind of comb through. But uh, we were able to find all of the animations back from you know all the way from 1.7 all the way down to 1.0, and so we are uh, currently getting those kind of all you know, gathered and arranged, and we plan on releasing those here pretty soon with some extensive documentation on how people with Oscar can be able to program their own animations, um, you know, according to uh, like a specific uh, schema or, or uh, scheme and how you would change the values. And then we're going to uh, release everything from 1.7 all the way down to 1.0. Um, and scripts that help you compile it and everything like that, and then uh, instructions directly to put it on your robot so you can change the animations, you can start uh, customizing Vector in a way that nobody ever has been able to before for the most part. So that's really exciting, and we're hoping to release that. I hesitate to give it a really solid date, but I'm hoping within the next one or two weeks. So uh, keep that um, you know keep that in mind. But um, that should be fantastic. And then... We also have uh, one thing that um, I did want to highlight is we've been working with Randy M. Um, if you're familiar with the uh, Vector Bible is what they call it, or the Vector Technical Reference Manual um, more officially, right? Uh, Randy has done some excellent work on that. It's over 500 pages of fantastic documentation on exactly who Vector is, how his subsystems work. And um, so we've actually looped in Randy to help us with the Oscar um, releases. Since Randy's very familiar, he's been doing this, uh, you know, he's been he's been working and research, researching Vector for the last probably two years since he came out. Um, that's been, so Randy's been a really helpful asset and we are uh, really enjoying working with him uh, to get everything, um, you know, to get everything released in, um, you know, in good order. So that's fantastic. Um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jacob or Matt. Do you guys want to tackle the manufacturing update? Yeah, absolutely, Jacob. Yeah, uh, I, I teed up um, some of the footage from Grant. Why don't, why don't I just kind of show people that really quick? I'll share my screen. Um, but Rick, while you're while you're enabling me to share my screen, I just wanted this. I almost feel like you know it's, it's school and I'm at show and tell. But uh, here you can see this is part of the QCQA testing for Cosmo. This was the initial uh, boards we were printing. Everything's over at the factory now. And uh, so we, we really don't need this, but this is part of the, testing the vision system that's on board, both with Cosmo and Vector. These are mostly Cosmo symbols, as you can, as you can see. And we'll show you a really quick thing called the playpen. If you're not familiar with the playpen, it's essentially the, the last step in manufacturing to make sure that uh, all the onboard processes are uh, operating correctly and uh, to make sure it's syncing with the app and all that good stuff. So I have some footage here from our CTO, uh, Grant Olson, who is definitely has earned the title GOAT, greatest of all time. And without further ado, I will share the screen really quick. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, looks good, Jacob. Okay, I'm just gonna. It's, this will be really quick, and then we'll pop back to the presentation. So I'll just just give you an idea. So this is one of the older Anki Cosmo um, units, and this is about. A, I've been wanting to post this for about a month ago, but it's essentially just seeing, calibrating, doing all kinds of stuff, making sure everything lines up. 
And this is kind of a behind the scenes look of how the, the QA, QC uh, protocols work here with Cosmo. And Vector will be going through something very similar. All right. So there is that. I'll stop sharing now. And a uh, definitely a special shout out to Matthew Mallet if you're out there. I've been I've been meaning to post this stuff and it's just it's been so nuts here for the past couple of months. Uh, but he uh, so Matthew was very helpful in getting all of the pieces that were scattered to the four corners of the planet and uniting it so that way we could put all this back together and accelerate the QA QC uh, program. All right. So, yeah. So when, so when do you guys start getting, when do we start shipping? When do you guys start getting your orders? That's coming. Uh, so we're looking at late, late May, early June, things will start rolling off. Uh, it's just a matter of like, I was showing you how, how long the QA QC process takes all the toolings purchased. Uh, we have all the components, all the chips, uh, that was something that I know some people in the community were concerned about. We purchased those months ago and they are all in hand. They are at the factory. We actually bought more than what we needed. So we're in good shape there. The only uh, asterisk I would say is that moving forward, um, going for what we're calling it like mass mass production, that's, that's going to require a lot of effort on our, on our end to make hundreds of thousands and millions. I mean, that's kind of the order of magnitude we're looking at now. So that's going to be a total uh, shift in how we're going to procure parts. But for the, for the pre-orders and for you know, our, our loyal customers, uh, we, we, we have you and we're, we're in good shape there. So that's, that's the update there. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be slowly with dribs and drabs showing like the DVT units, uh, so the, the development units, the engineering units, and we'll start circulating that. Uh, depending on how many we're going to make, we might even have a little auto where people can get them super, super early. It's an idea I just had this morning. That'd be kind of fun. So anyway, uh, more, to, more to come on that for sure. Uh, yeah, also, what I want to say to the community is thank you for all your support. We would not be here without it. Um, uh, very heartfelt thank you. It's been a long road, but <clears throat> finally, we, there's the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel. We're there. Um, very excited to see this. And yeah, so what, I won't steal any of your thunder, Matt. You go ahead and you talk about the rollouts and the on-shelf date and all that good stuff. Yeah, no. So I think the, the one thing, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover this really quick, and I know that uh, we're going to go back to, to Robbie, but um, as you can see on the slide now, we have uh, some of the pre-order windows and when uh, we, we have anticipated delivery. The one thing that I think a lot of people should be, and I, I really hope that it's, you know, everybody's really excited about this is we've decided uh, as a team to go ahead and roll out uh, the lifetime subscription to everyone uh, that is going to pre-order uh, Vector Robot. Uh, so you, if it, whether you've uh, already pre-ordered or are going to uh, pre-order a robot uh, before the end of the campaign on uh, June 12th, you're gonna be uh, eligible for a lifetime Vector subscription. And uh, you can also see there that uh, one of the things that we're doing as, as a company is we're going to shut down our pre-order campaign in order to uh, provide a little bit more demand for some of our partners at Amazon and uh, our retail partners that we're working with uh, through uh, ProTempo. Do you want to give them the, the, the on the shelf and the quote unquote street date, Matt? Sure. Yeah. No. So right now our street date that, that we've been discussing with uh, for uh, our retail partners is September 22nd for Vector. And that is the date that any uh, e-commerce stores uh, from be it Walmart, Target, uh, Best Buy, those will be available on September 22nd. The biggest difference uh, there is going to be that you will not be eligible for that lifetime subscription after the pre-order ends. So I think that's one thing that uh, if that's something that you, you feel is valuable, I would strongly recommend that uh, you, you go ahead and take advantage of that uh, the, the opportunity during our, our pre-order campaign. 
Right. So just just to be clear, um, so, you know, June 12th, that's the cutoff. And then what we're doing, we're giving the rest of June, July, August and September, basically exclusivity to our retail partners. So that means you're going to get you're going to start getting your products four months before they're even on the shelf at, at the very minimum. So that's that's where we're kind of just we're we're winding down the pre-order campaign and then we're shifting gears to mass retail. And yeah, so everyone who's pre-ordered is going to get the months before they're even on the shelf and then all kinds of exclusive fun stuff, including that sticker pack, which we just showed you. Okay. All right. And then let's bring Robbie back in. Robbie, I know that uh, you wanted to talk about some of the feature requests and things that the, the team are working on. Yeah. So um, it's, it's kind of a situation where I totally forgot to uh, initially um, tackle these when I was doing my first talk. So apologize about that. But um, I know a lot of people have been wondering like what, you know, what features are we considering for further, um, you know, firmware updates. And so I wanted to share a smattering of the, the things that I've gotten feedback on and that, you know, we've, we've lodged with our developers to start looking at for future updates. Um, so, uh, one of the, so probably the number one thing is people really want Vector and Cosmo to be recognized by other vectors. So that's something that, you know, Vector already has uh, some object recognition and that kind of thing in there. It shouldn't be too far of a stretch to, to add something like that. So we are looking into it. Um, there's also uh, requests for hard sleep schedules and user-defined robot activity or stimulus levels. So um, kind of going in with the... the uh, you know, with 1.7, there was a little bit of a decrease in robot activity, to, you know, depending upon the robot's age. And what we found was that, you know, some users wanted to adjust that manually. And so it would be great to have like a robot activity or stimulus level uh, kind of slider in the app. And so we're looking into something like that. Um, a hard sleep schedule that people can set to so that the robot doesn't wake them up at night or something like that would, would also be a good thing to add. Um, and there's a couple of other things that we've received, um, you know, feedback on as far as people wanting to see uh, features. Um, so people would like to see things like the Google Assistant. Um, that may be something that we look into. I personally, I would like to see what we call captive portal support. That's where in uh, in a lot of cases, like if people bring Vector to a hotel or to, um, you know, like um, maybe like a dorm room, especially, right, um, you know, college attendees that, that are in dorm rooms that have these web portals that force you to log in and authenticate that you're actually a student there. Um, Vector doesn't really support those kinds of connections right now. And it'd be really, really something fantastic if we could allow him to um, support that. That way, the, you know, people that, that don't have the ability to have pets or that are not, um, you know, in a place where they can have, quote unquote, free Wi-Fi access without further, um, you know, being, a, being authorized to be there, right? Um, he will be able to, uh, you know, we're looking at him to be able to support support those types of connections. Um, let's see here. There's a couple of other requests in there, but those are like the major ones that I've collected from the community. We're still uh, taking feedback on new features that you guys want to see. So please feel free to, um, you know, uh, you know, get those kinds of ideas in and you can either email us at support at digitaldreamlabs.com with some of those ideas. And we'd be glad to collect them from there. Um, we also have a Facebook group that we're, you know, that some of our staff is highly active in. We encourage you to look at ideas there, that kind of thing. Um, but I just wanted to share, you know, some of the things that we've collected and that we're looking into for future firmware updates. Um, so if you, thank you guys for, for, um, you know, uh, your your time and attention, and I will turn it back over. Robbie, don't go too far because we're actually uh, want to open up. We've had quite a few questions come in so far for both OverDrive and Vector, and so uh, want to get some of those uh, to Robbie and, and uh, Jacob right now. Um, had a couple questions come in regarding uh, the warrant, the extended warranty that we're offering with the pre-orders for Vector 2.0. And, you know, the, one of the questions was, you know, what, what type of activity might void uh, our extended warranty for Vector? That is a um, really good question. So Jacob, do you want to tackle that or would you like me to 
Go, Robbie, you're on a roll. Don't, cool. don't, don't let me get in your way. Okay, absolutely. So the spirit of our extended warranty is that we pretty much want to stand behind our product and take care of anything that would go wrong for the most part. Um, and, you know, there might be some small exceptions like, you know, you intentionally dunked vector underwater or something like that, right? Where, you know, it, there, there might be some things that fall outside of that, but, um, you know, pretty much any issue, that kind of thing, uh, we want to definitely take care of and make sure that we stand behind our product. Um, now, as far as customizations or different things that might bring a vector out of warranty, um, one of the biggest challenges is like when we are performing warranty support or something like that, um, if we have to like replace a robot, there might be some, you know, challenges with uh, like painting and things like that, that, uh, that may make those, you know, make certain body parts and things like that, you know, where they would normally have been reusable uh, for like a refurbished robot or something like that um, would make them, you know, ineligible for, for reusing. So there's a couple of ways that we can, uh, work around this to where we can provide maximum support. And um, basically, if you customize your vector uh, in, you know, ways that would be considered non-standard, um, like decal packs are pretty standard, right? We would, we would definitely, we can probably just, you know, remove those and, um, you know, either apply a different sticker pack or something like that, or you can apply it, you know, when you receive your robot back from repair. Um, but ultimately, it's kind of a situation to where, um, like, painting or putting new, you know, different aftermarket parts on the vector may, uh, it may not necessarily void the warranty, but if we have to replace the robot, then we would have to be looking, you know, we may return a robot that, that does not have those customizations. We wouldn't necessarily be able to swap the bodies out, per se. Um there's going to be some other considerations for the repair center that we need to still consider outlining. Um, and there's customizations, you know, out there that I, uh, for vectors that I haven't seen before. So it's a really involved question, but ultimately if you paint your vector, um, you know, just understand that we can't necessarily, you know, if we do have to replace it for any reason, we can't necessarily paint it uh, that same color. But in a lot of cases, we may be able to actually just replace the electronics inside there, re you know, repair the robot, send it back. Um, there, you know, th there's very little outside of egregious abuse or neglect that, that falls outside of the extended warranty terms. Um, so we should have you know, full terms posted here shortly. We did actually recently update our warranty policy on uh, our standard warranty policy on our uh, website. So feel free to take a look at that. And um, we're absolutely taking any further feedback or questions on that as well. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll just add, I'll make something really black and white here. If you go and you solder the PCB, you have voided your warranty. If you break the front load, if you break the front loader or crack something on the shell or something like that, we're also going to make certain we have plenty of replacement parts. That's been a big question from the community. We will absolutely have replacement parts. A so part of your warranty is we may even we may not even need to ship it to us. We can just mail you replacement parts if the front loader breaks or if the tr one of the tracks, you know, something something on the body breaks somehow. Uh, we can definitely just, just ship you a part. You can snap it and snap out. There should be no need to take uh, a vector apart anymore. That's why we have the battery underneath. So you can pop in, pop out. Should be very straightforward, very easy. And then the screens are going to be sealed properly. They We've upgraded the screens, all that stuff. So no more lines in the eyes or stuff like that. So there should be no reason to take vector apart uh, moving forward. Great. Thanks, Jacob. And I think that we kind of staying on, on that theme of replacement parts, uh, we have had a few questions uh, from the attendees about those replacement parts and whether uh, replacement parts that we're making available for Vector 2.0 or Vosmo robots, uh, whether those components might be compatible for the first generation Vector robots. They are. So, so the body is almost identical. Uh, so Vosmo or, Cos or Vector 2.0, let's call it, are almost identical. Uh, I think unless there's some sort of tooling I'm not aware of, I think that they should all be interchangeable. Is, it, I, am, I, am I missing anything, Robbie? 
No, I think the um, the tooling should be fairly interchangeable, and um, most of the you know parts and things like that are are going to remain the same. So we should be able to pretty easily send out replacement parts, even for Gen ones. I would I would think. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, I, that's what I thought. I I think we've we've kept I, the the tooling identical to to Vector one point. There are some internal modifications, like like the gearbox. We did a, a total revamp of the internals of the gearbox and where we're mounting the PCBs. But as far as the external parts where, you know, there's common things we see in the marketplace, like the front loader being broke and stuff like that, those are identical. Yeah. yeah. So right. absolutely. Um, so yeah, anything, bas basically anything on the outer shells, we should be able to replace and, and do so very easily. Yeah. And, and we'll, we'll start doing, we're, we're doing shots of that stuff already. Um, as soon as we have, we've built up a de decent inventory from from doing all the shots and the molding, we'll start making those uh, parts available, and then we'll just ship them from our repair center, like like we do the cars. We'll just put them in an envelope and and send them on their way. Cool. Great. Well, let's let's take one more question uh, for Vector before we move on and begin talking about Cosmo. Uh, we had a question uh, from atten an attendee uh, regarding that lifetime subscription uh, that we just mentioned. And uh, the, the question is, if a Vector 2.0 robot uh, were to die, uh, would that lifetime uh, subscription be able to be transferred to a replacement robot? Yes. Very easy answer. All right, well, thank you guys. So let's move on. And Jacob, don't go far because we're gonna be talking about Cosmo next. So Cosmo 2.0. Do we do we have some of the um, stuff from Russ that we can share with the community? Um, the well, renderings. Fact, I think, so yeah, we do have a. I think you're referring to uh, the renderings of Cosmo 2.0. Yeah. Uh, so we yeah we we have uh, in fact if if uh, the attendees notice. Uh, Cosmo there on, on the right side of the screen looks a little bit different than uh, the robot that might be sitting next to you on your desk right now. Uh, as, as we mentioned before, this is the Vosmo Vector Cosmo uh, model. And so what we'll have here in a second, we'll be able to share a couple other renderings, Jacob, if you'd like, we can go ahead. And yeah, jump. let's let's share the top down because that shows the most of the, the differences. Um, yeah, everyone, you're going to notice at the backpack, there we go. Yeah, it's sleeker, kind of kind of a little bit more modern, uh, more vector-like, uh, but the same experience that you would have with Cosmo is, is unchanged. Yeah. Great. And same, yeah, so, 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 so same timeline because they're being made from the same molds. Uh, it's we're we're talking about the same timeline. Sa same thing with the um, electronics. Actually, getting the electronics for Cosmo is trickier than than Vector, believe it or not, because um, a lot of things have hit end of life. So we've we've upgraded and had to change the headboard. We had to change a, a and reprogram and repin a lot of stuff. We had to change the pins on a lot of things. Uh, but all in all, everything's upgraded. Uh, New, obviously, electronics, et cetera, are much, much more advanced now. Great. Yeah. And, and same, same with, uh, I think, what we had discussed with Vector 2.0. So, you know, we'll be ending our pre-order campaign on June 12th and to, to make way for our retail partners. Uh, and we'll be starting a pre-order cam campaign with Amazon. Uh, um, in mid-July uh, with deliveries beginning from that campaign uh, on our street date of October 1st for Cosmo 2.0. Yeah. So just, just to emphasize that, so there's there's a, a Amazon campaign that's going to start sometime in July. Our pre-order on our website will end. Uh, the Amazon will continue to, to sell, and then they'll be shipping on their own timeline. And again, so pre-orders you're getting a month in advance. So again, October is when, is when the, the street date occurs. Just, I want to really hammer that home, Matt, just, just so everyone understands. Yeah, absolutely. I think we had one more thing that we want to look at for Cosmo, and that is, I think, just kind of showing some of the uh, 
redesigned packaging for Cosmo 2.0. Yeah, this the is cool. thing that I, I would note for all the attendees is that the charging base is not the pearlescent white uh, that is found on uh, Cosmo. It is uh, a black charger similar to Cosmo uh, 1.0 or the vector charging base. Yeah, it's universal. So that's the other thing too. So chargers are universal. I, uh, the, all the parts are going to be universal. That way there's no slight, you know, you can't wedge one in the charger versus another. This is just to kind of just streamline everything. Okay, great. Well, thanks, Jacob. Let's keep moving. Let's talk about the Butter Robot. And so the, for those of you that might not be aware, the Butter Robot is a uh, product that we're bringing to life uh, in partnership with Adult Swim, uh, Warner Brothers, and uh, Justin Roiland. Uh, this, this product, uh, the, the, uh, the pre-order ended um, at the end of uh, January this year, uh, but our, our team have been moving forward with developments. And uh, I think, Jacob, we're, we're closing uh, at the uh, tooling is, is uh, we're finalizing tooling now. Uh, but wanted to bring Brian Gardner back, our chief uh, gaming officer, uh, to talk a little bit more about what's going into uh, the Butter Robot and why even you know fans of Cosmo and Vector should be excited about you know some of the things that we're developing for a completely different robot in the, in the Butter Robot, Brian. Yeah, uh, I'm insanely excited about this robot. Uh, we've been working a lot on it. We've uh, been working really closely with Justin Roiland. He's, you know, really excited about it, very involved, um, and is, uh, you know, constantly communicating back and forth with us. And I think we're going to deliver something, you know, really unique to the robotic space. Uh, we want this robot to be comedic and absurdist and, uh, like, delightful in that way, um, and really have the emphasis be on its humor um, and matching the humor of the show um, in the sense that it's like, you know, a little sardonic, cynical, absurdist, you know, just good humor. Um, so one of the, the key features that we're working on and we're going to talk about the most today is what we call garbage brain. Uh, we just need funny internal names to keep things straight and keep things moving. Uh, but this is how it generates its dialogue and it's, uh, it's just it's text. Um, so it actually is going to be running off of a much more powerful server. This is similar to the idea we did with, you know, Cosmo originally, where the Cosmo robot has a, you know, smaller internal brain and then works off of your phone's, uh, you know, you know, processor and such. So it has more power. This is an extension of that. So we're making all of the dialogue on a server and then your, uh, robot through your app will be asking for these really interestingly created sentences based on context. So your robot will ask the garbage brain for a sentence that fits a particular mood, and then it will craft a sentence for it uh, based on that context. Um, the way I like to think of it is kind of like pottery, right? So the first thing you need is you need to get your clay together. Um, and we're gonna do that in a variety of ways from super complex neural networks trained on dialogue and you know specific types of phrases that we'll want to say uh, to Markov chains, which are a bit like a little lower tech, um, reading from large databases and kind of, you know, smashing words together based on their probabilities that they follow each other, uh, to really structure Mad Libs style sentences, um, you know, where it's just from like a, you know, put a noun in here, put a verb in here, and then straight up pre-written crafted messages. And by having this variety, uh, you end up with a lot of texture from the robot. It, it's, it keeps it unpredictable, but the way it's going to respond to you, sometimes it'll say things that are just like a human would say it. Other times it's kind of that computer gobbledygook that can be really funny and entertaining um, and everything in between. Uh, so we, we get that sentence, but we still need to make it match the context. Uh, and part of that is from where we're generating these sentences from. We have a lot of different databases that have in hate and innate qualities like mood or um, timbre uh, of speech, those, those kinds of things that we're gonna pull from. But then we need to kind of shape it and construct it into a sentence that makes sense based on the context. Uh, so it'll be replacing names. So proper nouns will become things that are relevant to the user uh, as opposed to just from the source material that we're pulling from. 
uh, adding emotion. So we have uh, like all, not all, but all words coded to their emotional value. Um, and we'll be swapping words in and out to try and make it match. If it's supposed to be happy, you know, it'll replace, I don't know, rain drop with rainbow because it's a happier word, stuff like that. Subtle things that kind of push it in the correct direction. Uh, we'll edit the structure. Sometimes it'll be kind of being poetic. So we might make it talk in haiku. Uh, other times, you know, it'll be, we'll force it into run on sentences. So it feels like it's rambling. Other times when it's angry, we'll staccato it sentences. So it has to be talking really rapidly in short bursts. Um, and then we might add specific words if there's like something really specific we're going for. If it's a greeting, you know, we'll make sure it says hello or hi, th th those kind of like really specific cases. Um, and then once we've, you know, so we've crafted, we've got our clay, we've kind of molded it into a shape and then we've got to, you know, fire it and turn it into pottery. Uh, so we're going to fix the grammar. Uh, we find that computer gobbledygook is funny, but it's funnier when it sounds like a person would actually say it. So we want it to be kind of nonsensical, but still sound like something you might've actually said. Um, so we're gonna make sure that the grammar is you know, much more rigid. Uh, and then we gotta send it to the robot, obviously, because it's all happening on a server. And then once it's on the, the robot, uh, it'll generate the, the voice. And we've been doing a lot of work to re-engineer the voice. Um, we actually found out that the, the voice came from uh, uh, me and Jacob's alma mater, Carnegie Mellon but we have been editing it a lot uh, to make sure that it's understandable. Uh, it keeps the same tone and timbre and that high pitched kind of, you know, funny, like monotone robotic voice, but it, the original engine couldn't handle all, all words. So we're re recreating the engine so that it can, you know, say anything and you'll understand what it's saying so that you can follow along with the, uh, the strangeness of what it's trying to say to you. Uh, and this is really just the backbone of the whole experience. It can do a lot more than just talk, but we think the way it talks is the most unique part of it um, and really just, you know, pushes through the whole journey that we're trying to establish with this robot. Um, so we're, I'm really excited to be working on it. Uh, Justin, again, is really involved in this and, you know, constantly tweaking the way that we're making sentences or asking us to do new things or, you know, he, you know he's going to write some of the sentences that it will say. Um, and uh, the, we, we just want to keep that process going and make sure that we deliver something that we're proud of, you guys are proud of, and Justin is proud of, and the whole Rick and Morty team. So. Yeah, and I think, Brian, that's one thing that I think that this product, we could say, has evolved quite a bit uh, over the, the past six months, uh, and in a large part uh, because of the... the close uh, relationship that we've had in working with Justin and the team from Adult Swim. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this the original pitch was so much smaller than where we are now, but it's because of uh, our excitement and his that when we talk about new things, instead of just saying, okay, that's outside the scope, we're like, well, could we actually make it inside the scope? Can we actually do that? And we start exploring it. Sometimes the answer is no, and other times it, we're, we're, we're doing it. So uh, it's kept him excited and involved uh, in a way that, uh, you know, I, I wasn't expecting. I thought he'd sign off and be like, all right, go make it. You know, I'll see it when it's done. But, you know, I, I talk to him constantly about it, which is really helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one thing, and we'll bring Jacob back to talk more about the manufacturing side of this. But one thing that I want to note for everybody that, you know, might have taken part in, in the pre-order window, uh, you may have paid, I think for the original, uh, the original pre-order offer was for, I believe 149, uh, because of a lot of the updates so, and, uh, development and, uh, additional things that Brian and the team and our mechanical team have been able to bring into this robot, uh, when, when the butter robot is available through retail, uh, it's, it's going to be coming to market at a $249, uh, price. So that's, uh, obviously a significant savings uh, if you were able to get into those those pre-order campaigns, uh, which ended um, earlier this this year. Um, and and as, as we said before, you know, looking at um, the, the the street dates again, you know, uh, through our distribution partners at ProTempo, we're actively working uh, with retailers to bring the Butter Robot 
to major retailers uh, near you. Uh, be available originally uh, e-commerce only, uh, but that street date there is uh, no sooner than October 15th. Yeah, and an analogy I'll use, uh, we, this started off as, let's say, a Motorola flip phone project, and now it has turned into an iPad mini. Uh, so this, <laughs> this has turned out to be a lot more advanced than we have we anticipated. Uh, very exciting, though, because we built it from the ground up, so it's, it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the tooling's done. Uh, we have all the components ordered. It can, we can make it now and ship it now. The the issue though is that we want to make 100% sure that Warner Brothers, Adult Swim, and Justin, and uh, ev everyone else, all the stakeholders on that side are 100% satisfied before we get it in anyone's hands. So I'm not 100% sure about the May 15th delivery date. Uh, we might need to put an asterisk there, but like uh, like you're saying, Matt, Everyone got an awesome deal on it. Going to get it way before mass retail. And uh, it's going to be a product that it's going to be, it's, it, it, it'll blow you away. I, I really do. I'm, I, I, what Brian's just touching the tip of the iceberg on this. I don't know. We could probably spend three hours talking about it. But this is going to be a whole other interaction. And this has actually pushed something I want to mention with Digital Dream Labs now. It's kind of pushed us into thinking differently about how these robots are going into the house. So we can think of Vector sitting on your desk or at work or something like that, hanging out like a cat would. And then we can think of Butter Robot hanging out in, in the kitchen and just you know getting your butter for you at the very least, right? And so we can, we can start thinking of the house. There's not gonna be necessarily Rosie the robot running around doing all your household chores, but each portion of your house will have a different robot in a different domain. And we hope that that's going to be a digital dream labs product. Okay, great, Jacob. Thank you. All right, guys. Well, we're going to bring Robbie and Brian back now and uh, ask the team, you know, let us know what your questions are about any of the products we talked about. Do you have questions about overdrive, uh, the all new app, InfiniDrive, uh, the charging tracks, any questions for Vector, Cosmo, or the Butter Robots? Uh, the team are here to answer questions right now. And I think we're going to get started with a question, Jacob, about you know the, that lifetime subscription. Uh, there might be some folks on, on the webinar today that aren't familiar with the subscription model for Vector and what that really gives them access to. Yeah, so what we're going to evolve, I think, long term is there's going to be built-in capabilities in all of our robots and unlocking various features. And I think that's the overall holistic view. I think that's where we're headed. So, um, you know, you can think of having a, a cellular phone plan and there's the you know, one particular level. Uh, that's, that's how I'm seeing Vector. So Vector, you'll have access to everything with the unlimited plan, if you will. The, the lifetime unlimited plan give you access to features, any updates, anything that we're doing, all that stuff. Um, that's that's going to uh, be be the way uh, rolling forward. I and so you know again, hypothetically with new robots that are rolling out, we might might be doing something similar to that. Cosmo doesn't use our servers or anything like that. That's a, a strictly standalone product, so that's fine. And, and the rest of the Cosmo family might not even require that, but we're thinking with the more advanced stuff. Butter Robot, we have leaned that out. It's in, because we built it with our own coding, that's never going to require a subscription or anything like that because we, we started with our own architecture and built it from the ground up. So that's that's going to be a much more straightforward. Um, but if you're if you're talking about more advanced AI, more machine learning, and, and stuff on the edge, and and more vector-like computing, um, and especially maybe that's where Bingo would fall in. You know, you, you like you have ADT security and stuff like that. They charge X number of dollars per month to secure your home. This might be something similar to that. So that's kind of the high-level thinking. And then yeah, vector the unlimited lifetime access it gets you any feature, any updates, or any other things we might update in the future. Great, Jacob. And I think, you know, um, we, we, the next question I want to address, and, and we possibly, you know, skipped over this when we were talking about uh, Cosmo, uh, but was the, you know, 
Cosmo classroom coding curriculum. Um, could, could you give the attendees a, a better understanding of how that uh, classroom, uh, how we've partnered with the Carnegie Science Center to develop that curriculum and what that means for the potential for Cosmo in the classroom uh, with, with uh, you know, a, a more holistic EDU approach. Yeah, and do you have that summary slide we just made um, that shows like, you know, learning from puzzlets going the whole way up to butter robot? That might be something cool to show. Uh, yeah, I can talk about it briefly. We have that on, on the deck today. Okay, because I, I, I can, I might, let me see if I can pull it up and I'll share my screen because I think this will give everybody like a real, a real good idea of where we're headed as a company and also just uh, connecting the proverbial dots, if you will. Let me see if I, let me see if I have it handy real quick. But yeah, so um, if we think about uh, all of our products as a whole, we, we can think of, let's say, Puzzlet's our original product being the intro course. Um, and the that intro course is teaching basic, basic computer skills, you know, looping, uh, modifying negators, things like that. Um, yeah, why, why don't you, why don't you uh, share, share the screen real quick and I'll, I'll, I'll pull up uh, the slide. I have it handy. All right, so, and of course we have the transcription thing going on. So um, so we can think of puzzlets here, pre-K. We can think of Cosmo, uh, grade school to middle school, and, and possibly high school if you're, if you're getting a little bit more advanced here. We kind of think of overdrive as kind of all encompassing. Cosmo and Friends introduces it, uh, the, in, the idea of robotics, et cetera, at a, at a younger age. So then you can think of like, you know, Butter Robot and Vector being on the older end of the spectrum as far as personal robotics. What, what I'm really excited about is that this spot right here, so this, these are products you grow up with through your entire life of um, experiencing personal robotics. And so you're introduced very early, let's say at kindergarten, you're learning puzzlets, how to program and do all those things. And then that kind of sets the stage for Cosmo and Vector. And, and then eventually you're getting into, you know, embedded Linux and other, other things that are a lot more advanced. So the, th so this is kind of the overall view. What's really great and what we haven't really talked about, and it's kind of killing me, but we'll, we'll get to talking about it eventually, is that we have, uh, we have the basic uh, guide, let's call it, that is the Cosmo book that kind of has a walkthrough and we have a teacher uh, from LA Unified that does walkthroughs on our website there and you can sign up for that kind of stuff. And as a result of your pre-order with Cosmo, you get that as part of your order. The other thing that's really cool and that's also part of the, the Cosmo pre-order and I'm very excited about it, but just we haven't been playing it up is the Carnegie Science Center curriculum. And it's basically Cosmo the Cosmonaut and you treat Cosmo like he is a Mars rover and you are NASA and you are going through all the protocols and all the steps and all the preparation to get a, ro a rover ready to launch, launched and then communicate to that rover once he's on Mars and then Cosmo is basically your rover and it is it is really slick. I think it's a really great program. It's meant for summer schools, uh, but it's also meant for like eight to 12 week curriculum as well for uh, middle school children. And I just, I think it's outstanding. So that's one thing I want to make mention. You know, we don't forget mentioning that and, and calling attention to something that's very, very interesting. I'd eventually like to build curriculum around Vector, but we're going to let Robbie do his uh, documentation, which is extensive first, and then we might have some more high school or uh, college related curriculum surrounding that stuff. Well, great. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, we also had Jacob, uh, we have you a couple questions that have come in regarding the uh, accessories that, that we mentioned on uh, one, of, one of the slides earlier for Cosmo and Vector. Uh, I know. I know. We've we've talked with our partners about the the idea of bringing back the carrying case and uh, additional color treads. You know, could, could you, we have a, we've had a few questions about the accessories. What what other accessories you know can we share today? 
Uh, so I think I, I think everyone's on the same page from our distributor uh, to our manufacturer that you know the the carrying case, the treads, um, everything that was being made previously is coming back. Uh, I don't think there's anything we're going to say no. We're not going to do it uh, at least up to this point. And then it's it's whatever you know creative things we can think of. I, I see all kinds of so when it's going to come to like plushies and things like that. We are letting our partners over at Sutiki, so the, the ones who are making the um, Cosmo and Friends series, we're really going to let them and their expertise and their vendors take care of that stuff. So if you want to have a little, uh, you know, jumper or who knows how you want to dress Vector, I'm, you know, uh, you're, you're going to be able to order that kind of stuff through there. And the sky's the limit. I mean, there's there's really nothing you, we couldn't do, right? Um, I, I, so we, but we don't have a firm accessory plan. So what I can say straight, straightforward is accessories that we had in the past, bring those back. And then just, you know, the, your imagination is the limit as far as things we can, uh, add to Vector or Cosmo. Great. Now I think, we, and we have a couple questions for Brian and, uh, for, for Overdrive and Jacob, you might be able to help. Uh, answer the first, and that's what is the difference between power drive and InfiniDrive? I know that, that that's been a, a common question that we re, we've received from OverDrive fans in the past. Yeah, so we just like InfiniDrive better. We think it's a it's a cleaner brand. <laughs> so we're killing we're killing power drive. Power drive, uh -uh, we're not doing that anymore. InfiniDrive is really what it is because you will you know it will feel like you will be driving infinitely. Power drive, you know, we're not really giving you more power. We're not making the car uh, stuff like that. So it's it doesn't describe what we're doing as concisely. So so don't think so. Power drive is infinite drive. So don't even think about. I mean, we went through and did the trademark branding and all the copyrights and all that stuff. We're turning the page on that. We're just it's a straight up infinite drive. That's actually what it is. It's a better descriptor, and that's. The, yeah, so just it's just cleaner. Let's, but but there's there's there is essentially from a technology standpoint, there's no difference. Okay, great. And then Brian, I think we, we had a couple questions about the commanders from uh, the OverDrive 2.6 app, and whether any of those um, might be making an appearance in the all new app for Infinite Drive. So we have no plans to do so. Uh, we really want it to be a completely new game. Uh, so fully reimagined characters, uh, new environments, uh, new game modes, all that stuff. We, we don't really want to be tethered to the, the old stuff. We want it to still exist. We still want you to be able to play it if that's what you prefer. But we want this to be completely new uh, and let our artists and designers really just dream up all the new people that fit the, the new game we're making better. So. OK, great. And I, I can't skip over this one. Michelle wants to know where she can buy Robbie's Vector T-shirt. Yeah, this Not was... <laughs> no, I actually really love this T-shirt. Um, this was bought... Um, this is from Inkbot. Uh, I'll, I'll share a link, but it's actually a, a particular community member. Um, I think her name is Lori. She does some fantastic uh, artwork for Vector. She's got T-shirts... Um, mugs and uh, quite a few other things, including like phone cases. But I really like supporting some of the community members that uh, that bring, you know, additional interactions with Vector. And um, this was honestly one of my favorite shirts from her. Uh, I have like three or four, but um, I'll definitely share a link to her shop just, you know, um, with the understanding that it's not coming like officially from Digital Dream Labs, but she operates a really good shop. She ships very quickly. And um, again, I just love community involvement and I can appreciate anyone that brings stuff to the table. So I uh, definitely wanted to support her and um, love the shirt as well. So I'll yeah, share a link. Absolutely. Uh, Robbie, I'll second that. I love the, uh, I think everybody on the call today, we can say that uh, we love the this robotics community. It's, it's been a great experience. Hey, uh, so we, we do have uh, one last question. I think uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. But uh, Joel asks, and this is a question for you, Brian, uh, will, will Butter Robot's light blink when it talks, uh, the same as in the show? Uh, I really wanted to line up. But one thing that is different is his camera eye is also going to light up um, to help him express how he's feeling uh, so it can change colors and such like that. Uh, we still do have the the other blinking LED, the the one from the show, 
but we wanted more. <laughs> um, so he's going to have a much bigger, brighter light uh, as well. Um, so oh, that's great. And I, I guess I, I will I will say I, I lied. There's there's one last question, and uh, Jacob, uh, we'll I'll throw this over to you. But uh, we have had you know, I think one uh, or a few people have asked about the investment opportunities in Digital Dream Labs. Obviously, we're talking about a lot of exciting things happening right now. Uh, we currently have the Honeycomb campaign, uh, which is, I believe, 120% funded today. Um, you want to give a quick pitch for the, the Honeycomb crowdfunding raise? Yeah, yeah and, and I get a lot of this stuff. Uh, and so we also have probably some Republic people on the phone. So I'll go ahead and do some, some you know, cut and dry business boring stuff uh, right now. Um, but, you know, from our perspective, it's extremely exciting. Uh, but the... Yeah, so the Honeycomb campaign is just a local Pittsburgh thing where we're adding icing to the proverbial cake. If you want to participate, it's a revenue sharing deal, and that's great. A lot of people simply just aren't interested in that because they want to own equity and they want to be part of our, our, our massive growth. And so how do you do that? You need to own shares. There may or may not be a possibility of that in the future. I can't go into any details. There's so many regulations around all this stuff. And then with the, the number of people who are attending right now and all that, I have to be careful what I say and what I don't say. So there could be something in the future that's very exciting. We will probably not do a crowd raise. Um, I don't want to say never, never, but it's, un, it's extremely unlikely we will do a crowd raise in the future. Uh, so probably the last uh, opportunity would be the honeycomb. And again, it's it's revenue sharing. It, it acts like a bank note. You're earning interest. And then, you know, we're obligated to pay you based upon our top line uh, revenue every, every month. So that's one. That's that's the opportunity that's currently available and that can be to non-accredited investors. So that's that's fine. And the other updates I'll give to the our Republic people out there and our shareholders, uh, the numbers are looking really good. Uh, our run rate's excellent. Uh, the proverbial hockey stick is upon us. I will get more detail though. We're having a formal audit. We're going two years back. So we're having auditors take a look at all of our numbers. They're pre it's pretty much done. And then I, we're, we're kind of like cleaning up all the corporate financials and, and all the corporate documents and stuff like that to try to take things maybe to the next level. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. But yeah, so that's, that's kind of my condensed pitch, if you will, as to what's going on in uh, investment land. All right, great, all good news. Well, Robbie, Brian, Jacob, uh, Appreciate your time today. And, and likewise, for everybody in the robotics community that's joined us today and our Republic investors, thank you for sharing a little bit of your day with us. Um, please stay on uh, so that uh, we can ask you answer a brief five question survey. Again, that'll allow us to improve our next quarterly update and make sure that uh, we're best serving uh, you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Right. Appreciate it. Thanks, you guys. Enjoy your guys' yeah. weekend. Yeah. Take care. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. <laughs>